Hallelujah. Lift your hands one more time and just appreciate God for his presence. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's such a privilege and such an honor to be gathered. He said, where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you are. We thank you for you are here. Thank you for you are here to speak to us, to reach us, to touch us. We thank you for our lives will not remain the same again. I ask that you cause the seed of your word to be planted in our hearts. Cause light from your word to shine in our hearts and on our path. Let faith rise from your word and be activated in our hearts. And let your word be confirmed with signs and wonders following. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hallelujah. Please be seated. Please be seated. So... When Apostle Jide started ministering and he went to 1 John 5, 7, I leaned towards my wife, you know, and I showed her my notes. And the very first scripture on my notes was 1 John 5, 7. And that's kind of like a confirmation because while I was praying this morning, you know, um, the Lord said to me reinforcements concerning the sessions, that in every session there will be a reinforcement of the things that have been said. You know, when you have reinforced concrete, all right, you have sand, you have granite, you have cement, you have the iron rods, you have water, you mix it all together, all right, and all the different components have something that they are contributing to the strength of that beam or that pillar or that column, all right, that you're doing. So every session is contributing, all right, to the whole picture of what God is doing in our lives. Hallelujah. So I want to speak briefly on what I've titled divine partnerships. Divine partnerships, all right? And so first off, there is the partnership, what I'll call the partnership of the Trinity. So 1 John 5, 7 says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. So there are three distinct individuals, but one in essence. But in addition to that, we will see as we read scriptures that there is a partnership in how they work, all right? In Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was have form and void, and darkness was upon the face of a deep, and the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, all right? So we see the Word, Jesus is the Word, we see the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and we see the Father, the Trinity walk together in verse 26. He said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. We see the Trinity working together. So there's a divine partnership. In Acts 10, 38, he said, how God, the Father, anointed Jesus, the Son, with the Holy Ghost, and with power, a divine partnership of the Trinity. Hallelujah. So that's one. Secondly, there is the partnership of the Spirit. And by that, I'm referring to that partnership between the Holy Spirit and the believer. The Bible says in, uh, come on, 2 Corinthians 13, 14, Paul's last words to the Corinthian church. He said, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is another scripture talking about the Trinity, right? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. That word fellowship is from the Greek word koinonia, and it's translated in several different ways. I personally am of the opinion that the most um, appropriate word that I've seen that describes that word koinonia is the word partnership, the partnership of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So there's a partnership between the Holy Spirit and the believer. On the day of Pentecost, for example, the Bible says, and uh, cloven tongues of fire appeared upon every one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So there was a partnership there. They were the ones doing the speaking, but the Holy Ghost was the one that gave the utterance. So the Holy Ghost would, could not have spoken by himself. And they could not have spoken by themselves. The Holy Ghost supplied the utterance and they did the speaking. You know, every now and then, um, you're, maybe you're ministering to someone and trying to get some 
filled with the Holy Ghost, and the person is waiting for God to speak through them. It doesn't happen that way. You are the one, they were the ones that did the speaking. The Holy Ghost only provided the utterance. Are we seeing this? So there's a partnership of the Spirit. Acts 1.8, and you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. All right? So the Holy Ghost working with the believer to carry out the plan and the agenda of God. And we can go scripture after scripture talking about that partnership that we share with the Spirit of God. Jesus said, it is expedient for you that I go, for if I do not go, the comforter will not come. He said, when I go, I will pray the Father, John 14, and he will send you a lost paracletos, another comforter that will be with you. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'll come back to talking about the partnership, I believe, of the Spirit. The third one is what I call the partnership of the saints. As believers, there's a partnership that we share in carrying out the plan and the agenda of God. The Bible says in Matthew 18, 19, if two of you shall agree on earth. In fact, first of all, it says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. That's another one. And it says, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father in heaven. So we come into a divine partnership in the place of prayer. This particular prayer here is called the prayer of agreement, where we come in agreement in the place of prayer. The Bible says in James 5, confess your faults one to another. Pray one for another that you may be healed. There's a partnership where we're praying for one another. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The Bible says in Psalms 133, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the, what? The dew of Hermon. Abby, that comes, it's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the bird, upon even Aaron's bird that went down to the skirts of his garments. Next verse. As the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Acts chapter 4 and verse 23. After they flogged Peter and, is it John? All right, the Bible says they went to their own company, and they said, 23, not 33. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. All right, and then it goes on to say, they lifted their voices together and they prayed. And they asked that the Lord would grant them boldness, you know, and all that. And the place where they were was shaking and the Spirit of God descended upon them. That's united prayer. We partner with one another to enforce the will of God. Hallelujah. So there's that level of divine partnerships. Glory to God. Now, in talking about redemption, if you read the writings in the epistles, in Ephesians 1, for example, Paul speaking, in verse 7, he says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. If you check out the tense there, it sounds as though he's talking about something that has already happened, something that we already have, in whom we have redemption. Are we seeing that? And then by the time you come to verse 14, give me verse 14, please. It says, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. And so this particular one, the tense here is sounding as though this redemption is something that is going to happen. Are we seeing that? All right, so verse 7 is sounding like we already have this redemption. Verse 14 is sounding like we're going to have this redemption. So where are we? Do we already have it or we're going to have it? It's actually both. And I think the words of E.W. Kenyon is what explains it best for me. He said there are two sides to our redemption. The legal side and the vital side. There are two sides to our redemption, the legal side and the vital side. The legal side is done, is finished, was completed in what Jesus did on the cross. But the vital side is ongoing, and it's in what the Holy Ghost is doing in and through us. Hallelujah. So there's a legal side, and there's a vital side to our redemption. The legal side of our redemption is the purchasing part. You see, in every transaction, there are two things that happen. 
if you're doing a transaction, you're going to buy something and all that. There are two sides to that transaction. You know, there is the purchasing part of the transaction and there is the possessing part of the transaction. Now, in everyday, you know, um, activities, most times those two parts are not clearly shown. So you just go and say, Malam, give me Tom Tom. All the money you collect and then you go. It's not clearly shown. Um, but sometimes there are certain stores, for example, I don't know if you visited a store where you make payment for what you want to get, then you take your receipt and go somewhere else to collect what you paid for. So what that shop has done is separate the two sides of the transaction. They separated, separated the purchasing part of the transaction from the possessing part of the transaction. So you go here to purchase where you make payment for it and then you come over here to possess where you lay hold on that which you already paid for. Let me give another example. How many of you have bought something online before? It's usually clear in online transactions. All right, so you go online, you see a very beautiful pair of shoes and say, ah, I like this shoe, I like this shoe. All right, and so you order the shoe and then you make payment for the shoe. At the point where you make payment for the shoe, you have already purchased it. Legally speaking, that pair of shoes belong to you. However, you are not yet in possession of what you have already purchased. Is it making sense? So the payment part of that transaction is complete, is finished. However, that thing that has been paid for has not yet been possessed by you, even though you have paid for it. Are we seeing this? Yeah, so the, maybe the, you get a dispatch rider or something that will eventually deliver to you what you have already purchased. So at that time where you are standing there and you don't have in your hand the pair of shoes that you paid for, does it mean you don't have it? No, you have it. But you have not yet possessed what you have purchased. And so when we say there is a legal side and the vital side of our redemption, we are saying there is a purchasing part of that transaction, which is what Jesus did for us. We call it the finished works of redemption. Meaning the payment part of this thing has been completed. There is no other price that needs to be paid. Jesus paid and paid it in full. It's fully paid for. Hallelujah. But then there is a possessing part of it. And so sometimes you look at your life and you feel like, you know, the Bible says I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, but I'm not yet seeing the manifestation of this thing in my life. And sometimes Christians get, you know, um, have a challenge in that regard. The reason why is that even though this thing has been paid for, you have not yet possessed. And so Jesus, after he finished, you know, the purchasing part of our redemption, he said to his disciples, he said, it is expedient for you that I go. For if I do not go, the comforter will not come. You know, if you are there, you'll be like, we don't want comforter to come. You just stay, we'll enjoy you. No, but Jesus was saying, everything that I've done will be wasted if the comforter does not come. Because even though I have made the payment for all these things, you will not be able to possess it. The work that the Holy Ghost does in partnership with us, we're talking about divine partnerships, yeah? The work that the Holy Ghost does in partnership with us is to help us to possess the things that have been purchased for us. Hallelujah. Somebody say divine partnership. And so we must partner with the Holy Ghost to lay hold on and to fully possess what we have paid for. Hallelujah. So there's a legal side of our redemption and then there's the vital side. The Holy Ghost is the one that helps us in working in partnership with us to possess what has been purchased. You know, several years ago, my wife and I run a business, and we got into this. Um, we got into this. What would I call it now? Issue. We had some money that was stuck somewhere in the bank, and so we had to engage the services of a lawyer, all right, to help us get our money out. All right, and so 
we got this lawyer, we spoke to him, this is what's going on, this is the case, blah, blah, blah. All right, and so we took the case to court. And so we went to court, I showed up in court. To that <laughs> we showed up in court. So I remember the day we were in court, magistrate court at that place. So, <laughs> and so the lawyer met us before, you know, and he briefed us and he said to us, just come in, don't say anything. The moment they mention your case, stand up and shall identify so we know the, the lawyer and all that. He shall coach us. This is what to do. And so we got into the court, and one, when it was time for our case, they mentioned, and I think it was even my wife that stood up, and then we didn't say anything. We didn't say a word. The lawyer was the one talking. My Lord, this something, something, this is... This. Shall talk, talk, talk. And then afterwards, the judge or the magistrate ruled and ruled in our favor that the money should be paid to us. So I remember coming out of the court that day and standing with our lawyer and saying, Oh, yeah, where the money? And our lawyer said, You guys don't worry. Go back home. All right. I'm going to come back to the court. He said a certain day and I'll collect the written, whatever of the. As I tell me, you know, he's a lawyer. I uh, shall collect this stuff. I'll take it to the bank. He said, they'll garnish the bank. I'm sure lawyers will understand. Garnish something. They'll take it to the bank and do whatever they will do. And then the money will be paid. And so we shall left. Okay. So at that point, legally speaking, the money belonged to us. However, that money was not yet our or in our possession. So we now needed the partnership of an advocate. Does that sound familiar? Comforter, counselor, helper, advocate, standby, intercessor. What's the other one? Strengthener. We now needed the services or the help of an advocate. You see, if not only me, Patakot boy, they don't rule, say the money now. Uh -uh. That day, that day. We go, we not go agree. Oh. 2024, no grief for anybody. They must give me my money today. Do you, you, you understand? But we needed someone who understands principles and procedures, how they are carried out in that place. And that's what the Holy Ghost is. He understands exactly what needs to be done. And so we need to learn to partner with him so that we can, else all these things will be in vain. Are we together here? Yeah. So we must partner with the Holy Spirit. And so I learned a couple of things from my, our interactions with the lawyer in that particular case. And I think they are instrumental in our dealings with the Holy Spirit. Three things to do in partnering with the Spirit of God. One of the things we did, number one, we talked to the lawyer. We went to let him know, oh, this is what's up. This is the case. These are the issues. And so in our dealings with the Holy Spirit, we must learn to talk to him. We must learn to relate with him. In prayer, we're communing with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is as much God as the Father is. Apostle Jude was has done a beautiful job laying that foundation, right? So we talk to him. We commune with him in our relationship with him. We'll commune with him, we'll talk to him, we'll let him know what's up. He's, the Holy Spirit is not an it. He's a him. He has a personality. When Jesus was talking about him in John 16, I think it's verse 13, he said, when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but he, whatever he shall hear, come and help me. He will not speak of himself, Speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come or show you things to come. All right? He used that um, personal pronoun. Is that what it is? Personal pronoun, he. So the Holy Spirit is a person, is a he. He's not a human being, but he is a person. That means you can relate with him. You can have a relationship with him. You can actually talk to him because he is a person. Is, are we making sense here? Yeah. So talk to him. Number two, listen to him. Listen to him. So our lawyer told us this. Our lawyer told us that. 
And so we listened to him. Whatever it is he was saying, we listened. We paid attention to him. We didn't go, no, 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 no. We listened to him. And then quickly, to add to that, number three, we yielded to him. We did not argue with him. We did not say, no, I cannot wait. Eh, 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 they must bring the money out. No. When our lawyer said to us, you don't worry, don't bother, go, I'll handle the rest. We allowed him to handle the rest. We did not interfere with him. We did not argue or struggle with him. We allowed him to do what he could do. Hallelujah. And we yielded to him. And so in our relationship, or in our partnership with the Holy Spirit, we must learn that place of yieldedness. We must learn to yield to him. We must learn to allow him to play his own role, to carry out what he has come to do in our lives. Hallelujah. Allow him to lead. And so when we talk about partnerships, really, we need to also ask ourselves, what kind of partnership do we have with the Holy Spirit? So that word translated comforter is from the Greek word parakletos. And one of the translations, literal translations of that word is one called alongside to help. One called alongside to help. And if you are not careful, you will think, ah, this person just came to help me. You know, there are different levels of help. There is the help that you have at home that helps you with menial tasks. You know, is it Omar or Dodd that you call it? Yeah. You know, the last time I tried speaking to you about this conference, you were laughing at me. So if I'm not saying it right, tell me now. Don't wait till I go. <laughs> you know, so there is that level of help. Okay? Yeah. But the Holy Spirit is not that kind of help that is... Uh, that you are over, Abida that is under you. No. The Holy Spirit, or our partnership with the Holy Spirit, he's not our junior partner. He's not our co-partner. That we have 50-50, we have equal stakes. So we will say like this, he will say like that. No, he's not our co-partner. He's our senior partner. I think it was uh, David Yongicho that has a book, Holy Spirit, My Senior Partner. He's our senior partner. And so we yield to him. Whatever he says is law. So the way to maximize our partnership is to, number one, understand that this person is not our partner in that we are on the same level. Understand that this person is our partner. He's our senior partner. And the way we maximize this partnership is by yielding to him. Yield to the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Allow him to do in you and for you what only he can. You know, I was listening to a message, I think it was Terry Savile Foy, that shared this story. She said they were, um, I think it was one of these reality TV shows where they will cook, all right, and the best chef or something will win. And she said in this particular um, one, the finals, at the finals, they will bring a renowned chef, all right, to come and assist the finalists, okay? And so... You now work with that renowned chef to pre prepare your final, what's it called, meal. And then they will judge that to know whether you won. And so this person is not, this renowned chef that is coming is not the one uh, in the competition. The person was just called alongside to help. Do you get? And so she said this particular lady had this, you know, renowned chef, you know, there to assist her. And so they said, you are supposed to prepare so, 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 and so, and this one and that one. And so the chef was standing there. I'm like, so how can I help you? You know? And she said, the lady said, they just help me dice the vegetables. True, true story. That's how everybody, how can you have this kind of person with you in this competition? And you're saying, just help me dice the vegetables. I'll take care of the rest. She said, the person sharing this story, I didn't watch it. Someone was sharing this story. He said, even the renowned chef looked surprised. Is that what you really want me to do? She said, yeah, okay. And so all she did was help her dice the vegetables, did whatever, and hallelujah. And of course, the lady lost the competition because she had help that she didn't know how to maximize. Do we have help that we are not maximizing because we have not learned to submit to his leadership? Do we have help 
that we're not maximizing. We're not making the most of because we're not submitting to his leadership and to his lordship in our lives. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit is our helper. The Holy Spirit is our partner. He's here to help us to maximize the life that God has called us to live. Now, in project management, there is an aspect of project management called stakeholder management. All right? And one of the things you do in stakeholder management is uh, identify stakeholders. Identify all stakeholders. So if you're doing a project, okay, and all that, you want to identify all the different stakeholders, all the people that this project is going to impact in one way or the other. And so when we're talking about the help or the partnership of the Holy Spirit, we must also recognize that whilst it is true that, oh, he is here to make the vital side of our redemption a reality, we must realize that we are not the only stakeholders in what's going on here. That first of all, heaven or God that gave us the Holy Spirit is also a stakeholder. All stakeholders have expectations. So when God gave you the Holy Spirit, there were certain expectations that God also had. So it's not just about you. God did not just give you the Holy Spirit so that you'll be okay and comfortable, so that you will enjoy all that is rightfully yours. Yes, that is there. But you must realize that heaven also is a stakeholder in this project. And heaven has expectations. Hallelujah. There are certain things that God wants to see. There are certain benefits that God wants to get from giving you the Holy Spirit. That's why Acts 1.8, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come on, upon you and you will be witnesses unto me, not witnesses unto yourself. There is an agenda, there is an assignment. There is something that God has called you to and the, the partnership of the Holy Ghost is also important in your life because that's how you will fulfill that assignment. Hallelujah. When the Bible says in Ephesians 1.18, talking about the hope of his calling, I know many times we translate that to mean all right, what, what we can expect, what we can look forward to concerning his calling. But I also believe that there was a hope and an expectation that heaven had concerning your calling. When God called you, there were certain things that he wanted to accomplish through you. That's why he called you. You know, my pastor has something he calls, uh, come on, I think something about exemption. That whenever God chooses one person, he just rejected someone else. If I, if I say I want to choose somebody to stand with me, it means I rejected everybody else and chose this person. So why did God choose you and reject everybody else? Because God considered you strategic. That if I pick this person, through him I can reach all the other people. There are certain things I can do through this person that will impact all the other people. And so I picked this person first. And so you don't come into the banquet and just sit there lounging and enjoying, forgetting that there was a reason why you were picked in the first place. Heaven has an expectation. Heaven is a stakeholder in the project called Holy Ghost and you. Secondly, the world... Romans 8, 19 says the earnest expectation of creation awaits the manifestations of the sons of God. When God gave you the Holy Ghost, the plan was that through you, he will reach the world. And so there are people who are crying out there waiting for you to manifest. There are people who are waiting out there for you to begin to do the things by the help and by the power of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says it's him that works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God wants to work with you to accomplish certain things. And your life is, you see, our destinies are interconnected. There are people whose lives are tied to yours. So we're here celebrating, you know, rivers and wells. And Apostle Muiwa has gathered us all together. You know, and I'm just thinking to myself, I can't remember which year that was when you were telling me about CLC, this, that, that. I'm just imagining he did not obey that call. Just imagine that he did not yield to that in, uh, instruction that the Holy Ghost was doing. We will all not be here. We'll probably be somewhere else. I'm hoping that we'll all be in a good place, right? 
but will probably all be somewhere else. But today we can see the impact of his obedience to that instruction several years ago. And so you ask us, yes, ask yourself, what is going to be the impact of my obedience and my yieldedness and my submission in partnership with the Holy Spirit 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line? Who are the people that will come and meet me and say, thank you for answering the call. Thank you for responding. Thank you for doing those things that you did. Down to, you see, not every one of us is called to be a full-time minister or stuff like that. But little things like, you know, the Holy Spirit stirring you up to pray. One of the places where we see that partnership the most is in the place of prayer. Hallelujah. In the place of prayer. And God stirs you up to pray. Glory to God. You see, people are going to get rewards in heaven for things that we did not see on earth. Because they were not in the forefront. They were at the backside laboring in the place of prayer. And God will credit it to their account. And so something as simple as serving in church, you are playing your own part by the help of the Holy Ghost. Divine partnerships. There are people that God wants to reach all over the world in and through you by reason of that partnership. Praise God. So the partnership is not only for you or for your benefit. There are other stakeholders. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let me begin to close with this. Maybe there's someone here who, in the course of these meetings, not maybe, there is. In the course of these meetings, you've been thinking, I wish I did this. You know, you're beginning to regret, you know, and feel like I, I should have done this, I should have done that. You know, my pastor has a book out titled Jehovah on Time. And one of the things he said in that book is that there is no regret in God. There is no surprise in God. There is no failure in God. Hallelujah. God is always on time. Glory to God. You see, God knows how to align place and time and people and events to come to a beautiful ending. If you look at the life of Jacob, we see this repeatedly in scripture. If you look at the life of Joseph, sorry, not Jacob, you know, Joseph started his journey, had a dream, and God said, this thing will bow to you and all that. And then for the next, is it 13 or 17 years, it looked like it was the opposite direction that his life was going. But God still had a plan, and God had not given up on that dream. Hallelujah. In fact, the most beautiful part of that whole story to me was when he interpreted the dream of the baker and the butler. And he said to the butler, when you get back there, please remember me. And the guy got there and it seems as if selective amnesia just hit him. The guy forgot totally. But now I think about it. If he had remembered immediately, he got out. And he said, there is one Joseph in the prison. You know, that story would not have ended as beautifully as it ended. And so while Joseph might have been feeling bad that, ah, this guy forgot about me, God was waiting. Hallelujah. God was waiting. He said, hold on. We need two more years to perfect all, to put all the other pieces of the puzzle together so that he will sleep one night as a prisoner and the next night he is prime minister of Egypt. God knows how to align situations and circumstances to bring you. You see, the Bible says of God, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. So there's no difference. One day, one thousand years, there's no difference with God. He can collapse time, he can expand it. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yes, he can. So you are not disadvantaged. If you feel like, oh, you're a bit backward, you're not disadvantaged. I'll tell you what you need to focus on. You're not. We see several. You see another beautiful one I like in the book of, is it First Kings? The story of the Shunammite woman. I think it's chapter 4. She had, she saw the prophet and said, uh, uh, oh, let's prepare a room. Said to her husband, I perceive that this man is a man of God. Let's prepare an upper room for him, you know, and all that. And she now had a son. Remember the story? The prophet gave a word. She had a son. After a while, the son died. The prophet brought the son back to life. You know, and it looked like the story ended there. And then we enter chapter 8. And the Bible says Gehazi was now having a conversation with the king. Now, in chapter 8, he opens by saying the prophet said to her, there's a famine coming in the land. And said, take your family away and all that. And so the woman went away. By the time she came back to come and, ah, where are my property where I live behind? And so Gehazi was now having a conversation with the king. 
and he was saying to the king, talking about the things that Elisha did in his ministry. And he was now saying to the king, in fact, there was a woman whose son was dead and the prophet raised the son back to life. You know, in my movie mind, I, I imagine that the king was saying, Gezi, you don't deny. lie. Gezi, whose king live forever and I threw at do man, the woman picking die. But the prophet raised the king back to life. King said, I go, as they were having that back and forth, ay, 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 somebody say perfect timing. As they were having that back and forth, this same woman shows up. And uh, Gehazi said, oh king, live forever. Now the woman be this. Now Peking be this. And so the king said, what even brought you here in the first place? Say, ah, my property. He said, restore. Every, give me that verse. It says, and when the king asked the woman, she told him. So the king appointed unto her a certain officer, saying, Restore all that was hers, and all the fruits of the field, since the day that she left the land, even until now. I sense that God is bringing restoration somebody's way. In the name of the Lord Jesus, God is bringing restoration with compensation. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I came to announce to you, you are not disadvantaged advantage in any way. God can restore in one move everything that you have lost and then some. In the name of the Lord Jesus. There's nothing that he cannot do. He can align time and space and events and just bring it all together in a beautiful crescendo. There's nothing that he cannot do. Hallelujah. There's nothing. He can turn that situation around. You know the, the amount of precision. How is it that it was at that exact time that the woman shows up. Let me think, tell this other one. You know, the Bible tells of how that the stars led the wise men to Jesus. Has it occurred to you that it takes at least 4.3 years for the light of a star to travel to the earth? Between 4.3 and 300 years. So if you look at the sky and see the light coming from a star, that light did not just start. That light started shining 4.3 years ago, at least. So when it says the star led those wise men to Jesus, it's not that day as Jesus was born that that star started shining. That means at least 4.3 years earlier, that star started shining and started moving. The, the precision that that would have required is mind-boggling to me. But we're talking about a God. Hallelujah. Who is that? So what is it that he cannot do? You know, when we read the story of Abraham, Genesis 22, it says, the angel started, Abraham, Abraham, do not kill your son. The Bible says he turned and saw a ram caught in the thicket. And that's the ram he sacrificed in place of his son. Question, how did the ram get there? How did the ram get there? You know, sometimes we just think that the ram just appeared. Not likely. And they were at the top of a mountain. Which means while Abraham was climbing the mountain on one side. <laughs> And he was saying, the Lord shall provide himself a ram for the sacrifice. The ram had started climbing from the other side. The ram did not, I don't even know, he just left the pack of the other rams and was just going like this. And the other ones were bleating and he said, come back, come back, you know, I just go. And he climbed and he choked his, <laughs> stuck his head in the thicket. And then started crying. God knew. That, see my son, he is now headed in the right direction. So let the ram start going. You see, the Bible says, Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. I know we interpret it to mean the Lord that provides. But in the actual Hebrew, he says the Lord that sees. <laughs> he says, for in the mountain of the Lord it shall be seen. Hallelujah. So it was the Lord that saw ahead and saw that this need is going to arise in Abraham's life. And God started started making provision before that time. God has gone ahead of you and he is making provision for you. Every aspect of your life in the name of the Lord Jesus. I say God has gone ahead of you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. So there's nothing that he cannot do. But what's a clincher? Ephesians 1.11 says of God, he works all things according to the counsel of his will. 
everything that God does, he does in line with his will. Meaning, if God is even involved in any way in something that is going on, it is in line with his will. And so if you want to bring God's involvement in your matter, you must align it with his will. Once you bring it into alignment with his will, you can trust that God is in it. So some people are asking the wrong questions. Some people are looking at the future and they're asking God when. God when? When will I get married? God when? When will this ministry take off? God when? Other people are looking at the past and they're asking God why? God why did this happen to me? God why didn't this happen to me? The question you should be asking is God what? God what is it that I'm supposed to be doing? Hallelujah. What is it that I'm supposed to be involving myself with right now? Because I know that with you, you can turn this situation around overnight. I just need to be in alignment with your will. I just need to be in the center of your will and you will turn it around. Hallelujah. So God, what is it? And as he begins to reveal it to you, you yield to him. You yield to him. You yield to him. You surrender to him. You surrender to the lordship of the spirit. You surrender to the lordship of the spirit. Lift your hands to him. Just begin to pray. Say yes. Say yes to the Holy Spirit. Say yes to the lordship of the Holy Spirit. Say yes to the lordship of the Holy Spirit. Say yes. Wherever you lead me, I will go. Yes. Yes. I surrender it all. Yes. I turn it all over. Yes, it all belongs to you. Is that your prayer this morning? Right where you are, pray. Say, Lord, yes, yes. I say yes to you. I say yes to your will. I say yes. I say yes. I say yes to your lordship. You are my senior partner, Holy Spirit. I turn it all over. Come on, say yes, say yes. Ha, 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 ha. If you only knew what was on the other side of your obedience, you would say yes. You would say yes. I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Yes, I turn it all over. Yes, it all belongs to you. And so, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for realignment. Realignment in the lives of people. Realignment with the center of your will. In the name of Jesus, thank you for clarity is coming. Thank you for direction is coming. Thank you for strength is released. Strength to obey. Strength to do what you're telling your people to do. In this holy convocation, thank you for strength is released. Thank you for activations. Activations of graces. As people yield, activations of graces, of ministries, of callings in the lives of your people. Lord, we surrender our all to you. We always will. We always do. Let your will be done in us. In Jesus' matchless name.